my name is Martha Carney. I'm joining you at the invitation of the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations to host a discussion about the importance of bees, all pollinators in fact, the kind of threats that they're facing, what possible solutions can be found, and most importantly of all, how beekeeping can be a tool for sustainable development. And what better day to join you than on World Bee Day? That's today and it's a United Nations event to stress the importance of bees and to make sure that people around the world know about how to help them. And part of the impetus is an opportunity for governments, organisations, civil society and of course concerned citizens to look at all the different ways that we can help promote bees, help their habitats, which is very important, and also to look at their use in the world of sustainable development. But before we get going, here's a video specially created for World Bee Day 2020. Thank you. Well, that video gives you a little preview of what we're about to discuss. So let me introduce our panel. First of all, Dr. Nicola Bradbeer, who's an expert in epicultural development. She's the founder of Bees for Development and president of the Apimondia's Scientific Commission for Beekeeping for Rural Development. Today, Nicola and Bees for Development are announcing that Her Royal Highness the Duchess of Cornwall is to become president and Monmouth, where the organisation is based, is going to become Monmouth Bee Town with lots of signs celebrating that. We're also joined by Abram J. Bixler, who is a sustainable food systems expert for the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, involved with the International Pollinator Initiative. He's going to tell us a little bit later on about all about that. He joins us from Rome. And the University of Sussex, Dave Goulson, who's Professor of Biology. He's a specialist in the ecology and conservation of insects, particularly bumblebees. He's the founder of the Bumblebee Conservation Trust and uh, the author of many books about bees, including A Buzz in the Meadow and The Garden Jungle. You're all very welcome. Now, I'm an avid beekeeper myself. I once had seven beehives and through my love of the honeybee, I've become very interested in the whole world of, of bees, solitary bees, bumblebees. I've made lots of documentaries for television and for radio about the threats facing bees, uh, about their biology and also about their cultural significance. So let's begin now. Before we get on to the kind of threats facing bees, I just wanted to talk to all our guests about their own passion. So Nicola, what was it that first drew you into the world of bees? Well, uh, I was a student in the 1980s when there was supposed to be a world food shortage and I was working on uh, the use of plant proteins for human nutrition. Um, and at some point I was in India and because my father was a beekeeper I was always interested to look at bees and beekeeping in villages everywhere um, and I realized that actually beekeeping is the most wonderful means of poverty alleviation because when you train someone to be a beekeeper then they have to get interested in nature at the same time in preserving nature and uh, honey is the most uh, egalitarian food because even the most poor person can produce honey that's absolutely equal in quality to what somebody else can produce with the most tip-top equipment. So that was when the penny dropped and I thought, aha, this is a fantastic subject. Well, we're going to be coming to some of the detail of that a little later on. But Abram, how did you become interested in bees? Actually, that's great to hear Nicola's story because mine is similar. And 
before joining FAO here in Rome, I was in Southeast Asia and working in agricultural development. And in Thailand, where, where I was based and working, I came across uh, indigenous local knowledge on the use of, of local bees and uh, the creation of log hives for those. And it really just brought together this idea of of the, the socio-economic value of pollinators, but also the, the importance culturally and, um, and for, for a food staple as well, as well as for medicinal properties. And so seeing all the, the benefits that, that bees and pollinators, um, honeybees as well as many other different types of, of bees globally that uh, really got me interested in bees and pollinators. And Dave, you were interested in all different aspects of nature from when you were a small child. But how was it that bees captured your imagination? I, yeah, I was, I've always loved insects. Don't ask me why since an early age, but I really started um, getting, getting hooked on, on bees much later in life, uh, when I was about 30, I guess, 30 years ago now nearly. And uh, um, I was idly watching uh, some bees in a patch of flowers and I noticed that they, they often miss a flower as if there's something wrong with it. They'll go close to it and veer away at the last second. And I spent five years studying, uh, trying to understand what that was all about and discovered that they're sniffing the flower for a, the smelly footprint of a previous visitor, another bee that was there earlier that tells them that the flower is empty and it just saves them a bit of time. And I, I thought that was really kind of cool and fascinating. And uh, I, was, I was hooked and have since uh, spent the last, 30 years studying other kind of aspects of their behavior and life cycles. You had a bit of a disaster, didn't you, when you tried to rescue some rather wet bees? Yeah, so my earliest memory of bumblebees pretty much is I was about six or seven years old and I, I found these wet bumblebees that had been caught out in a rain shower and I, I, I thought I'd rescue them. And uh, foolishly being young and naive, I took them indoors and, and put them on the uh, the, the hot plate of the electric cooker and I put it onto the lowest setting and put a little bit of tissue paper on top of them uh, as like a, a blanket and, uh, and but it, it was one of those old-fashioned electric cookers that takes ages to warm up and I got bored and kind of wandered off and next thing I knew there was smoke billowing from the kitchen and the tissue paper had caught, caught fire and the poor bees were frazzled, uh, which was quite traumatic, particularly for the bees, but also for me. And uh, I, I, maybe I've been, I spent the rest of my career trying to kind of make up for that, I suppose. Well, there are other more serious threats uh, facing bees than overzealous young naturalists. And that's what I'd like to come on to now, because there's a huge range of issues and we're going to discuss um, all of them. Uh, there are uh, there are pests. There's habitat. There's misuse of uh, pesticides. Many different things. I wanted to begin though inside the hive and then move. And um, beginning first of all with you, um, Nicola. People will know or may well have heard about the varroa mite. Just explain to us um, why that's why that's a threat to the honeybee. Okay. Well, uh, varroa is a mite of Asian honeybees. And uh, the Asian honeybee Apis rana lives quite happily in the presence of this mite. But in the last century, when we began moving bees around, uh, we moved bees from Asia into Europe and the rest of the world as well, and moved bees in all directions around the world. Uh, we introduced this mite into new uh, honeybee populations. And it's not really the mite that kills bees, it's, it's uh, rather topically the virus is carried by the mite which kills honeybees and when you introduce that virus into new populations of honeybees they have no resistance and uh, it's been a big pest for the beekeeping sector in the last 50 years or so um, but it's not in every country a problem the same the, beekeep the beekeepers in Africa they have no problem with varroa because they keep bees naturally and the varroa arrived and the honeybees evolved through natural selection and the ones that survived in the presence of the mite survived and those that didn't died out. Um, so I think it's a problem that we can get over sooner rather than later just by allowing bees to evolve in the presence of the mite and uh, natural selection will arrive at bees that, that survive okay with for our bees. Bees have evolved for such a long time on earth. They've met many problems over their 
evolutionary history and this is just another damn thing that we've uh, given them to dealt with to deal with uh, yeah and i have seen the effect themselves i mean not just the united king but also in the caribbean i'm going to visit an island where there's a great beekeeper there called bee man and they had great crops of honey but then when varroa hit that was pretty much put a to beekeeping there dave are there other pests as well which are affecting bees at the moment there, there are many, many uh, diseases and parasites of, uh, of bees of all types, viruses, bacteria, fungi, mites, um, and nematodes. Um, most of them are perfectly natural. They're part of kind of biodiversity. They've been around for millions of years along with the bees and, and aren't really anything to worry about. They're, in fact, maybe we should celebrate them. Um, the difficulty comes when we accidentally move these diseases or parasites around the world or expose them to host bees that have never encountered them before. And exactly with the varroa mite, we also have issues with other bee diseases that we've accidentally spread around the world. Uh, things like uh, Mesema, which um, we've we, there are several species, it's kind of like bee diarrhea, but we've accidentally moved strains of, of Mesema around the world. Uh, and many of these Parasites will infect multiple species of bee, and so the Nesema, some strains will attack honeybees, some bumblebees, and some will happily hop between the two. And we found recent, fairly recently in the UK that many wild bumblebees are suffering from a, a strain of Nesema that comes from Asia, um, and it often kills them. So we should be, we should be a lot more careful when we're uh, moving bees around to ensure that we don't spread their diseases around. People think that the moving of bees has been an issue in the United States, the trucking of bees across the country to pollinate the almond crop in California. Some people think that's leading to colony collapse. What are your thoughts? You know, in terms of, of looking at um, some of these, these threats to pollinators, um, this, the, one, of the, one of the things that comes to mind is just it's, this example of, of almonds and the intensity of the beekeeping sector in the United States and trucking them and, and following the flowering patterns, you know, I think that um, it, it definitely is a, is a microcosm of the larger intensive agriculture that, that is, a, is a threat. You know, in intensive agriculture that, that has uh, a monoculture is homogeneous, often lacks diversity. Um, it often is is pesticide intensive, and um, you know I think one of, one of the threats is this the intensive agriculture that we see and the habitat loss along with it, and the the use of or improper use and overuse of of pesticides as well. So a lot of these threats are all interconnected, and as the other speakers have have mentioned, the movement transports. Um, pests and diseases, it introduces exotic invasive species as well. And then when you couple that with climate change, altogether these, these are really a perfect storm for, for threatening uh, not only the honeybees, which are you know, really intensively managed, but also other pollinators of which there's at least 20,000 bee species and then multiple types of mammals and birds um, that are, are really some of the tip of the iceberg in terms of the understanding pollination and, and even the wider habitats and ecosystems as well. Nicola, certainly loss of habitat is an important issue, isn't it? Yes, it's, it's really a big problem. Um, I think when it comes to forests, loss of forests, uh, this is where beekeeping has a big role to play because in the tropics, the beekeepers are really the guardians of the forest. Those are the people that are season after season harvesting value, valuable honey and beeswax from forests and play a big role in, in protecting that forest. So I think uh, for forest habitat, beekeeping is a wonderful, valuable uh, monetization of the forest resource really that's completely sustainable. Um, and we need to talk more about the value of, of beekeeping as a conservation activity in forests. Uh, but here too, of course, habitat for bees is a problem. We know that beekeepers uh, half a century ago were getting much higher honey crops at this time of year. 
here in a, a country like the UK, we've lost so much hedgerow, so much habitat that used to provide food for bees and food for insects in general. Um, but it's nice to see quite a lot of initiatives to bring back that good habitat. We don't just need biodiversity, we need bioabundance as well. We need a great abundance of flowers at this time of year to feed insects. And we will come on to the kind of solutions we could look at. But I also wanted to ask Dave about climate change and whether you saw that as a factor at all in the difficulties facing bees. Yeah, sadly, climate change uh, is really impacting particularly on bumblebees. Uh, my favourite bees, uh, and bumblebees are big and furry as an adaptation to thriving in cool climates. If you look where in the world bumblebees are common, it tends to be in fairly wet, temperate, cool places like Britain or in the Alps, or and some live right up into the Arctic Circle. Um, but they don't like warm weather, they fizzle out in warmer parts of the world. And so not surprisingly, um, they're being really hard hit by warming. Um, they literally overheat, their fur coats are too much. And um, we've already seen clear evidence that in, in the Northern Hemisphere, ranges of bumblebees have contracted, the so southern edges have moved northwards. But sadly, the northern edges haven't moved northwards. So essentially, the, the ranges are getting squashed from the bottom, which is really concerning. And future projections about what climate change might do to bumblebees are, are really alarming because they suggest that quite a lot of species will disappear completely. On the question, Abram, of um, pesticides and modern methods of agriculture, you'll know that the pressure that there is on mold to produce food, and many farmers will say that they need these tools. That's a great, great question. And, you know, there, pesticides are a, a broad range of, of different pest control options. There are insecticides, which control insects, and there's fungicides which control fungus and herbicides which control weeds and you know in in the um, really industrialized agricultural model pesticides are are needed farmers would say that they they use pesticides in order to help make make agriculture more efficient to um, reduce reduce the the labor inputs especially for things like herbicides and uh, also for for protection with the insecticides and um, Certainly, there are, there are a lot of sustainable agriculture solutions that, that can be integrated. Um, there's a technique known as integrated pest management, which, which looks at the, um, the complexity of the agricultural system and, and provides different solutions from crop rotation and, and healthy soils to help prevent some of the pests and diseases to uh, judicious use of, of pesticides when needed. Um, to biodiversity, in increasing the diversity, and, and I like that Nicola said, the, the bioabundance of, of not just crops, but also um, surrounding plants as well, and, and integration of animals into, into agriculture. So there are certainly solutions. Um, there's reasons why farmers use, use pesticides in, in terms of controlling pests. Um, and, and certainly a way towards, towards helping our pollinators would be judicious application and use of pesticides, um, applying them when the pollinators are not present, applying pesticides when uh, the wind velocity is low, um, knowing what the, the flowering plants are around you, where the providing habitats for, for the pollinators as well. So there's really a spectrum in terms of, of things that we could be doing to help pollinators um, you know, from the judicious use of pesticides all the way up to really redesigning our agricultural systems, making them more biodiverse and um, making them more resilient in, in the face of all these threats that, that we're talking about. Well, let's move on to some of those solutions now and to this lovely idea that Nicola introduced of bioabundance. How can that be created, do you think, on a small scale for individuals, uh, Nicola, and on a global scale? That's uh, quite, a, quite a big question. <laughs> uh, on a small scale, uh, if we look at gardeners, really there's no reason for gardeners, amateur gardeners, to be using the tough uh, uh, 
agrochemicals that, that actually here in the UK you can just buy quite easily. These are really potent chemicals, uh, herbicides, insecticides and fungicides all kill bees actually in different ways. They're all, they're all lethal to bees and people really need to understand the power of these chemicals and, and not to use them in amateur gardening really. Uh, of course it's lovely nowadays young people are talking about regenerative agriculture there's lots of optimistic uh, discussion now even in these virus times about really adopting a completely new approach to agriculture we have to maintain biodiversity loss of biodiversity is a bigger crisis for us as climate change so we have to get biodiversity up the agenda and understand that every scrap of land has to be now put into use into maintaining this bioabundance and biodiversity. Dave, your work, your research has taken you all over the world. And um, what kind of solutions would you like to promote when it comes to biodiversity, habitat for all the different species of bees? Great question. So um, I completely agree with Nicola that I, I would love to see a transformation of farming to truly sustainable uh, methods um, uh, with much reduced or perhaps completely eliminated use of pesticides. And I, th I think there's enormous scope there, but I won't go into that. Um, I'll touch on something much closer to home because I also think there are enormous opportunities to make gardens, villages, towns, cities into nature reserves, particularly for, for insects. Uh, you know, to invite insects in to, uh, to, to live with us. Um, and there's actually already a lot of interest. A lot of people buy bee-friendly or butterfly-friendly flowers and put up a bee hotel and so on. And if we could encourage that, we'd get more people to do it. Um, just very briefly, if you want to make your garden insect-friendly, bee-friendly, then plant some bee-friendly flowers. There's lots of advice out there about which ones are uh, great. Don't mow your lawn so often. Don't use any pesticides. I personally completely convinced we, we absolutely don't need any pesticides in garden settings. Uh, put up a bee hotel and you've got your own little bee paradise on your, on, outside your back door. And just imagine if every garden was like that. There's half a million hectares of gardens just in the UK. Uh, and then if you add in all the, the green space, the parks, the cemeteries, the road verges, the roundabouts, Imagine if councils were managing those, filling them with wildflowers. Then I think that it's an easy win, really. It's, it's, it would be fantastic for wildlife, not just bees. Uh, and it would also help to re-engage people and, and nature by bringing nature to us. Um, so that's something, actually, this is a terrible, shameless plug, but I have written a book, The Garden Jungle, about uh, how you can uh, make your garden into a, an insect paradise. And I think it would be a fantastic thing to get everyone to do. And for people who may not have heard of bee hotels, just explain to us what they are. So um, there are many species of bee and I, most people are, are completely naive or uh, oblivious to the fact there are 20,000 known species of bee in the world. Um, and many of them live on their own, they're solitary. So very, very different to the honeybee, which we're most familiar with and, and to bumblebees. A solitary bee is just a female bee, makes a little nest on her own and fills it with pollen, lays some eggs. Um, no workers, no queens or anything like that. And some of these solitary bees like to nest in horizontal holes. Naturally, they might nest in a clay bank or in a, a hole made in a dead tree by a burrowing beetle, say. Uh, and those kind of habitats are in short supply these days in the modern tidy world. But they're really easy to recreate. So just get a block of wood and drill a bunch of holes in it roughly eight millimeter diameter, um, or get some bamboo canes and chop them up and bundle them together, stick them on a south facing wall or fence, and you've got a bee hotel. And with a bit of luck, um, you'll get mason bees and leaf cutter bees and yellow face bees and a whole bunch of others uh, move in. And uh, it's really fascinating to watch, a uh, great way to, to engage kids. Very good way to get to kids to engage with that. And Abram, I guess another way of helping bees would be to get people to understand their economic importance. So many crops need pollinators, don't they? And I don't, people may have seen those very strange photographs mm -hmm. of um, some fruit crops being pollinated by hand in China because there weren't enough bees around. 
Yeah, you know, pollinators, when you look across the spectrum of pollinators, not just the, the social honeybees or other social bees like the, the stingless bees, but the solitary bees, um, the multitude of insects, of birds, of bats, um, just the, the variety of pollinators is, is astronomical. And about three quarters of the world's fruits and seeds that are consumed by humans depend at, at, on, at some level for their quality and quantity on, on pollinators, you know, the, the big broad classification of pollinators. And about 87 of the world's leading food crops are dependent to some extent. Uh, it could be improved quality, it could be improved quantity on pollinators. And so it's, it's, it's staggering just how um, tied our food security and our nutrition security and our um, livelihoods, especially the livelihoods in, in many parts of the developing world are tied to pollinators. And additionally, ecosystems, the, the supporting ecosystems that support us as humans by cleaning our water and providing healthy soil for our crops and the oxygen we breathe and filtering the pollutants. Um, the, the majority of the world's seed producing plants need pollinators in order to do that. And so, you know, we're really intricately linked to the health and well-being of our pollinators. And um, that's really, you can really see that, especially in, in countries where, where FAO is working in terms of of the sustainable development goals and development and, and how tied um, to that we all are, but especially um, livelihoods in, in a lot of those situations. And that feeds very well into the kind of work that you're doing, Nicola, through uh, Bees for Development, because you see beekeeping is a very important tool for helping people find pathways out of poverty. Yes, indeed. As I said, honey is, is this wonderful product that is known by every society and in every society it has a value. It's always regarded as a, a wholesome, worthwhile food. Every religion values honey. So everybody really knows honey and in every society it finds a good market value. So whether you sell it locally or to a distant market or even export it, there are always good markets for top quality honey and even the poorest beekeeper can produce absolutely perfect honey the bees the bees produce honey it only loses quality as 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 it goes along the market chain so even the most poor and most remote people um, ironically a lot of developing countries have actually better resources clean undamaged resources retaining for bees natural habitat that's good bee forage so they produce good honey and also very good beeswax beeswax is on demand on the world market it's very hard to get clean residue free that means no no industrial pollutants in the beeswax and again ironically the poorest countries can produce the cleanest beeswax because they don't have industrial residues in the beeswax so there's all sorts of potential there to help people um, produce the honey and beeswax and get it onto good markets. And turning subsistence beekeeping into really seeing beekeeping as a small business that can create cash income, uh, that's what the work of Bees for Development is. Perhaps you could give us a concrete example from one of the countries you work in of the kind of economic difference that you've seen. Yes, uh, we have so many examples. <laughs> Just recently, we've been working a lot in Uganda with disabled people. And, you know, in every society, disabled people tend to be left behind. And that leaving behind is even more exaggerated in poor countries. And it's amazing. We're working with uh, some beekeepers who are blind. And you might think it's impossible to do beekeeping if you're blind, but they have apiaries with the beehives and they have strings around the hives so they know exactly where they are and they work very gently with the bees. It's, it's marvelous to see. And we would typically say that um, a beekeeper can create income. They don't need to be a full-time beekeeper, just adding uh, beekeeping to your um, kind of portfolio of income opportunities. If you're a poor person, you need to build a resilient livelihood by having a lot of 
small ways to make some income but a typical kind of income from bees would be about two hundred dollars a year something like that which can be very significant for someone who maybe has a an income of a dollar a day so it can can make a big impact on a poor person's livelihood well i'm just going to pause the discussion for a moment there because we've got a late addition to our panel it's an entomologist dr samuel ramsey who's based in maryland and has worked in fact all over the world he's also known on social media as dr bugs and thank you for coming into the discussion i think you'll be doing some work on the murder hornets uh, good to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me. That is quite accurate. I have been researching the murder hornet. Uh, it, uh, I think that that name is really what's propelled it to stardom uh, as of recently because they've, you guys have been dealing with them. We've been dealing with them since uh, last year, but it's, it's right now when the New York Times has published this article calling it the murder hornet that everyone's attention is on it. And is it really that much of a threat? It is it would be, it would certainly be a threat if it were established in the U.S. We're doing everything that we can to avoid allowing it to become established. Um, the impact that it would have on honeybee colonies would be quite dramatic. Um, a, a portion of the U.K. already has Vespa velatina, which is a closely related but smaller species um, that is not as, um, not as damaging to honeybees. But Vespa mandarinia is the most damaging hornet species to honeybees and the impact that they can have on our beekeepers I'm also very worried about because of how much they like to try to protect their colonies to the death. These things can be a problem. Now you've joined us at the part of the discussion where we were talking about how honey and beekeeping can be a tool for development. And I mm -hmm. know that um, as well as your work in the United States, you've worked overseas as well in, in Thailand. And so Precisely. what are your thoughts on, on how beekeeping can be used in that way? I think beekeeping for development is something wonderful that uh, people are really just beginning to harness the power of. Uh, in an in industry like beekeeping, while there can be, uh, while, while it feels like there's a, a pretty substantial energy of activation that we have uh, to getting all of the equipment necessary, um, when you get things going, uh, it's a self-contained, self-sustaining process um, that can really help individuals who have been disenfranchised in a number of ways establish themselves, uh, get back on their feet. Uh, it gives them a level of freedom and agency uh, where they can move their lives forward without being dependent um, on infrastructure that isn't present, without being dependent on other individuals who may not uh, want to help them or may not have the incentives to do so. So uh, I'm really happy uh, about seeing the direction that this is going in areas like Africa, Haiti, uh, regions that um, regions where efforts to um, promote independence uh, economically in, in small areas uh, have fallen flat in a number of ways. Abram, how important do you think that uh, beekeeping can be in terms of transforming people's lives around the world? Yeah, I agree with, with um, Samuel. I mean, we've, we've mapped the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, um, some of you might be familiar with. This is the, the 2030 agenda, and we've looked at how bees and pollinators can, uh, can help to contribute to the, the SDGs, and there's 17 of them. And what we found is that many are touched on by, by the power of, of bees and pollinators. And, and I think unlocking that potential is, is going to be super important in terms of improving livelihoods and giving access to many otherwise disadvantaged people and helping with, with livelihoods. On top of all the, the agronomic benefits and the ecosystem benefits that they provide. And, you know, in, in many places around the world, bees and pollinators have already been an important part of culture. They've been an important part of medicine. Um, there's a lot of strong social cultural values already with, with many of these, not only bees, but also the other pollinators, the birds and the bats and the, the insects, the butterflies there. And so I think there's a lot of potential for really unlocking pollinators to, to help um, achieve the SDG, SDGs. And Dave, do you think that if people understand the importance of beekeeping economically, that's also a way of protecting habitats throughout the world for lots of different species? 
I hope so. I mean, wild bees and honeybees, or, uh, wild pollinators generally, they all suffer from the same kind of set of problems very largely. So if we if we ensure that our honeybees are healthy and that there are plenty of flowers for them and they're not exposed to too many pesticides and we control the spread of diseases and so on, then that will benefit all pollinators, uh, which, which is vitally important. I mean, honeybees and managed bees are the, the, the honeybees, the single most important bee species in the world in terms of pollination, but it gets an awful lot of backup from wild pollinators. And actually for many crops, more than 50% of the pollination is done by these wild insects. So it's absolutely vital that we don't, uh, don't forget about them and uh, make sure that in, into the future we have healthy populations of managed and wild bees. Nicola, we saw in the video at the beginning of our discussion the very close relationship there can be between indigenous people and different kinds of bees, stingless bees, for example. That is important, isn't it? Yes, that's right. Uh, it's it's not just all about one species of honeybee. There are there are quite a number of bees that people use, and uh, stingless bees are found all around the world in the tropics, and they produce honey as as managed honeybees do. Who knows? We we're so messing up our honeybee populations. It may be that in the future, um, honeybee beekeeping as we know it at the moment may be become non-sustainable and then we have to really look further at these other bee species like stingless bees that do produce significant amounts of honey um, all sorts of interesting stuff about bees that we really don't know much about yet but there's a lot of wonderful bees out there that are producing honey as well as our well-known honeybee bees that we keep in beehives so uh, some people all around the world are harvesting honey from these other species and they locally know a lot about them but science doesn't know a lot about them so we have to take care to learn about them but to stop moving things around the world so that we don't introduce more and more diseases into these lesser known species of bees. Sammy do you think that's right do you think that the world of science needs to look beyond the honeybee, beyond Apis mellifera? I do think that it's important that we acknowledge the contributions of other organisms. Uh, aside from just honeybees, we have had a very substantial focus on the honeybees uh, with good reason. They bring a substantial amount of money to the economy uh, every year, the worldwide economy, uh, the economy for the UK, for the United States. Uh, however, uh, as I believe Dave was saying earlier, uh, there are a number of other bee species that uh, have uh, that bring a lot to the table that are able to pollinate a number of plants. They really do pull their weight. Um, several studies have been conducted that have shown um, that other honeybees, or other species of bees from the stingless bees, the solitary bees, your carpenter bees, your sweat bees, uh, these organisms are capable of pollinating plants uh, and they are very important ecologically. Um, their numbers have been declining substantially and unfortunately they have not received the attention that honeybees have. Uh, I don't think that that means that we need to stop focusing on the honeybees themselves. Honeybees are still very important. Um, they are vital to the economy and vital, uh, vital to so many ecological landscapes. Uh, but I do think that some balance would be very helpful in that. And David is interesting and I've discovered this from the programs that I've made, how interested people are in bees. It's as if they're a symbol of our nature, but the people have a real affection for bees. You see, once, once you have a bee view of the world, you see bees in posters, on food labels, absolutely everywhere. They're, they're, we have this love for bees, really, don't we? We do, uh, thankfully. I mean, bees have become the kind of poster child for, for the rest of the insects. Um, and of course, all insects are, are important and are, are in decline. And actually, right now is a really interesting time because um, a lot of us are locked down, unable to, to do much apart from stay at home in our gardens. And it's, it's really interesting. I think right now people are noticing bees more than in a normal year when they're busy driving to work or whatever. And you look on social media and the like, everyone's taking photographs of the insects they can see in their garden and tweeting excitedly about which species they are and, and so on. It's really cool. I think we are, you know, perhaps seeing people um, re-engaging a little bit with, 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 
with nature, which is, which is wonderful. Abram, do you think that the lockdown could be an opportunity for us to rediscover our love of nature? I hope so. I, I really do think that um, it, it, this has caused us to, to change our ways and to rethink uh, a lot of what we're doing. I've, I've heard some reports just about how nature is bouncing back in a lot of places and with you know, reduced pollution levels, um, to, to give an example, just how that has helped um, different species. And um, yeah, I think if nothing else, maybe it gives us more time for self-reflection to, to try to find our place in the world and, and really our responsibility as well as consumers um, and our responsibility as, as those who depend upon agriculture, but also the ecosystem services that the bees and pollinators bring to us. And Sammy, I was reading, and I don't know whether there's uh, scientific uh, research for this, but actually the lockdown is helping bees because normally levels of air pollution can disguise the scent of flowers. And so this is helping bee populations find sources of nectar and pollen. Absolutely. The lockdown itself is helping bees just from depriving them of uh, several of the inputs that we bring into the system that can be problematic in a number of ways. Just the fact that fewer people have been out cutting their lawns uh, is a testament to that. Several of the flowers that bees depend on early in the season are plants that we consider to be weeds. And we're very quick to mow them down and uh, decry their existence. But things like dandelions are wonderful for bees. We're not out there uh, mowing the lawn and stepping on them and doing a lot of the things that we do to disturb um, these pristine environments. And the bees are benefiting from it. Nicola, is there hope in the lockdown? Yes, it's absolutely wonderful. As Dave said, people are noticing a whole new dimension to their garden, that it's not just about plants. Uh, learning about the insects and being able to identify them, there's a whole new dimension of interest that people hadn't noticed before. So yes, all sorts of good things happening in those gardens, yes. And finally, I can't let you all go without a mention of honey, because as bee lovers, surely we're all honey lovers as well. And just tell me your, your favorite honeys or your favorite uh, recipes, beginning with you, Nicola. Oh, favorite honey. Uh, I have to say the most delicious honey that we can produce in Britain is heather honey. It's marvelous honey, very, very special, thick, so tropic, delicious honey. But the best honey is always local honey. Support your local beekeeper. Abram? I've had some pretty amazing forest honeys from the forest of, of Northern Thailand using um, some of the local bee species that were, were out of this world. And Dave? Uh, I, I'm gonna have to say bumblebee honey, which might <laughs> weird and isn't available in the shops but bumblebees make honey too it, it, and it's really nice pretty similar to, to honeybee honey um, but you only get about two teaspoons from an entire nest so uh, it, it's uh, it's not easy to get your hands on and i'm not sure you should be taking that away from the bumblebees frankly <laughs> it used to be popular a, a, a thing that during harvest time when uh, people used to harvest with a scythe, they would often discover a bumblebee nest. There were some species that nest just above the ground and the, 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 the farmer would disturb them. And, the, and I imagine on a hot day, you're tired, you're running out of energy, you've been scything all day long, must have been damned hard work. And then you suddenly disturb a bumblebee nest. They used to sit down and squeeze out the honey and eat it there and then in the, in the field as a little kind of energy snack, an energy boost to keep them going. That's a great story. And finally, Sammy, your favorite honey. <laughs> well, uh, unfortunately, Abram uh, stole my answer a bit, but uh, <laughs> honey from Thailand, um, several of the forest honeys, but uh, I've also been really enjoying uh, giant honey, bee uh, honey from Apis dorsata, um, uh, typically a, a, a giant honeybees that nest on the sides of cliffs and really tall trees, uh, as well as Apis serana, a uh, honeybee just slightly smaller than than the typical honeybee. Um, for Mother's Day, um, I was actually able to make um, a honey glazed salmon recipe that was wonderful uh, using um, honey that, that I was able to bring back from Thailand. <laughs> Oh, wow. Well, you must have been a very popular son for cooking something <laughs> like that. 
On that note, I'll bring our discussion to an end. I'd like to thank the Food and Agriculture Organisation for suggesting that we all get together and talk bees today. And of course, uh, thanks to my guests, to Dr Nicola Bradbeer, to Abram J Bixler, Professor Dave Goulson and Dr Samuel Ramsey. Now, before we let you go, we've got a real treat, which is that Michael Omer, the composer who you may know his work from lots and lots of different television and film scores, including It's Good to Talk, he's joining us now to play his rendition of a very popular interlude. You'll recognise this. It's from Rimsky-Korsakov's The Tale of Tsar Sultan. This is Michael Omer and The Flight of the Bumblebee. I wish you all a very happy World Bee Day 2020.